Hi, today we're going to talk about something that has a fancy name, but is actually a very simple issue. At the same time, it's a very controversial issue. So we are going to talk about FDI, Foreign Direct Investment. Now, if you don't know what FDI is, let me give you the definition. FDI, that's when a person or a company from one country creates or acquires a company in another co country. Now, it's very important to understand that FDI is different from portfolio investment. Portfolio inv investment, that's when you buy shares of companies in a your country or a different country, but it's a small share of the company as a total. So buying shares doesn't give you control over a company. So you just take your cell phone or computer, go online, buy some shares or talk to your broker, buy some shares through a broker and you own, I don't know, 1% or maybe even 2% of a company or usually only a very, very small fraction of a company. So you have no effect on the decisions made by the company. You just own a small, tiny portion of the company and uh, receive your dividends or uh, sell the shares at some point and make your profits that way. Portfolio investment, that's when you actually in a sense control the company so in the cleanest example it would be you literally take your money lots of money go overseas and build a company there build a building install equipment um, hire people and uh, start running business so that's foreign direct investment it can also be that you go overseas and buy an existing company Again, uh, it may be there already, but you buy enough of it, let's say half of the company or, or normally 15 to 25% give you enough control in the company to um, count as foreign direct investment. But again, in the clean case, you literally either buy an existing company or you create a new company. And so that's your company. But since you're a foreigner, you brought your money from somewhere else from a different country. And so that's why it's called foreign direct investment. <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about uh, first, uh, what it is, how it happens, you know, what the dynamics um, are. But then also we are going to talk about pros and cons and who wins and who loses. Because while it seems like a simple issue, so people create or buy companies overseas all the time, there are all kinds of opinions as to whether or not it's good for both the country where the deal is happening, as well as the country that the acquirer or, or uh, uh, the company founder represents. So is it good when a foreigner comes and buys an existing company in your country? Is it good when a foreigner comes and creates a new company in your country? Is it good when somebody from your country goes overseas and invests money there and builds a business there? So who wins and who loses in this process? That's the topic of today's class. Now, <clears throat> I would like to first give you some definitions. Uh, there are what we call a horizontal and a vertical foreign direct investment. Horizontal foreign direct investment, that's when a company is created to um, <clears throat> create goods and services for the market where it's created. So for example, if let's say McDonald's opens um, a restaurant in China, that's what we call a horizontal foreign direct investment. because. The clients, the consumers of that good will be people in China. So the money goes, for example, from the United States to China. And then in China, that money is used to serve the Chinese market. The vertical direct investment um, type is uh, when money is invested overseas and um, uh, the products that are made with that money, with that company, actually go somewhere else. So for example, when Intel opens a factory in the Philippines, <clears throat> in most of the cases, the products would actually go not, or will be consumed not in the Philippines, but somewhere else. So those chips will be made in the Philippines, but they will be sold all around the world. So the Philippines is just the production site. And yes, maybe a small portion of them will actually stay in the Philippines, but the main target is somewhere else, not where they actually made. So that's what we call vertical. Sometimes you see kind of funny examples where it would be um, 
uh, you know, almost counterintuitive. Like, for example, here I have uh, pictures of <clears throat> all kinds of souvenirs with American uh, symbols on them, American flag on them. And uh, so they would be made in China, but they would be made clearly for an American market. So uh, that's a clear example of FDI that is vertical. So American companies uh, would create factories in China that makes, make those kinds of products, but clearly they would be then resold back in the United States. I don't think there is a huge market for uh, American flags in China. Though lately, increasingly, uh, the factories would, that make those kinds of products would actually be uh, Chinese-owned, and uh, it's not an FDI, it's just an American company plays an order for uh, a particular good, and a Chinese company makes it to the specifications and just sends the product back to the United States, so it wouldn't be an American-owned company. So lately, more and more, these types of products would not be a result of FDI, but more just an international trade type of deal. Interestingly, again, a related topic. <coughs> when I came to the United States for the first time, there were two products that I was very surprised about their country of origin. Um, one was uh, all these souvenirs with American flags on them. I was very, very surprised to see at that time that they all were made in China. You would think that something like that would actually be made in the United States, and no, it wasn't. So it was made in China, and I was like, oh, that's strange. And then at the same time, I was very surprised to see that uh, chopsticks, you know, when you go and eat in the restaurant, chopsticks, uh, the wooden sticks, those were actually made in the United States. And I thought, well, I mean, of all the things, those should be made in China. But no, apparently the process is fully automated. All you need to have is wood. And uh, my first trip to the United States was to Wisconsin, which has a lot of forestry, a lot of wood. And uh, since it's a fully automated process, labor cost is not really that important. So it would be made locally. So even though it's an authentic Chinese product, it would be made in the United States. Just something to think about. So today we're going to talk who wins, who loses, why, and is FDI good for America or when you are from a different country than for your country, for example, Lithuania or uh, Ukraine or Canada. And so to refine my question, it would be, for example, in the American context, is it good for America when a Chinese company buys an American company? Or let's say if you're in Lithuania, is it good for Lithuania when an American company buys a Lithuanian company, for example? Is it good for America when a Chinese company creates a new company in the United States? Likewise, if you are, let's say, in Ukraine, uh, is it good for Ukraine when an American company creates a new company in Ukraine? Uh, is it good for America when a U.S. company buys a Chinese company? Again, if you are in, in Lithuania, is it good for Lithuania when a Lithuanian company buys an American company or a Chinese company, whatever you take? And likewise, is it good for America when a U.S. company creates a new business in China, for example? Or whatever your country is, is it good for your country when someone from your country creates a new business overseas? <clears throat> if it was a lecture, you know, open lecture, I would actually ask you those questions and ask you if you think it's good or bad. And it's kind of interesting that most students are not quite sure what to say. Uh, the vast majority seems to uh, believe that it's bad when a country, uh, a com company from your country creates a new company somewhere else because, you know, it feels like, you know, we should be creating jobs here, not somewhere else. But people are more um, puzzled as to <clears throat> where it's wh whether or not it's a good thing when a foreign entity, a business for example, creates a company in your country or buys a company in your country. <clears throat> These things sometimes are emotional. Uh, for example, when um, Tata Motors of India bought, uh, bought Jaguar and Land Rover in England, in, in, in the UK, um, for the British, that was, you know, a sense of loss. I mean, how come our former colony is now buying our bigger brands, biggest brands, in fact? Uh, likewise, uh, when Lenovo, a Chinese company, bought American um, IBM PC division, again, for Americans, it was like, what? China bought our biggest computer maker? That's kind of wrong. 
Uh, but then on the other hand, why not? I mean, they paid a lot of money, so that's not like they came and stole it. So anyway, that's what we're going to discuss today. First, let me make sure that you know the definition. So here is a question that is likely to appear on the exam if you're taking this course for credit. And the answer clearly is B. FDI is a purchase of physical assets or significant amount of ownership in a company in another country, foreign, right? To gain a measurable control over the company. <coughs> Now, I want to show you a short video from a news report about FDI. Well, you know what one of the big issues was uh, last night in the election of the economy and jobs and on the job hunt today. In fact, finding one city whose skilled labor force and business environment attracting a big foreign investor. Welcome news in Syracuse, New York, where according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, 45,300 people were working in manufacturing back in 1999. Now, 10 years later, that has fallen to 29,300 people, a loss of 16,000 jobs in a decade in one town. Uh, David Lee Miller's on the ground there, live in Syracuse, New York. David Lee, good morning to you. Tell us how Syracuse is faring in this difficult economy. Well, interestingly, after those very dire statistics you just gave, Syracuse is actually faring pretty well. The unemployment rate here is about 8.1 percent, according to the most recent stats, and that's better than the national average and the average for New York State. Right now, I'm speaking to you from what was once a General Motors Fisher body plant. It is an enormous building. It was over one million square feet. It has now been divided up. Seventeen different tenants occupy this building one of which is a company called Bitcher Scroll, and we are in their facility right now. This bill, and this is the interesting part of the story, is a German-based company, and here you can see them actually making the air conditioning compressor units that they make here. The employment here started about a year and a half ago, about three dozen people. Things are going better than expected, and it is uh, hoped that there will be as many as 200 people that will be employed here in uh, the next... Uh, couple of years. Joining us right now is the plant manager, Mike McKee. Mike, uh, why Syracuse, New York? This, as I said, is a German-based company. Syracuse, not known for its tropical weather and wonderful beaches. Why was this lo location selected? Well, first and foremost was the availability of design engineering talent in the area, specifically with compression technology. Secondly, the manufacturing base is, is very strong here in Syracuse, and those resources are also available. You had a good pool of uh, potential employees, and you also got money from the state. Yes, uh, we do have a grant from Empire State Development that we anticipate receiving the first installment early next year. Uh, with the cost structure in New York State, certainly there are challenges, and for us to remain and become competitive, those incentives are critical for our future. Thank you very much, Mike McKee. Foreign investment, a very important part of employment in the United States, Bill. 5.3 million workers in the U.S. are employed because of foreign investment here. And throughout the day, we'll have more information on that and on other employment efforts underway. For now, I'll throw it back to you in New Good York. Good deal. Thank you, David Lee. Let's get it up for Syracuse now. I hear a lot about jobs leaving this country. Good to see foreign investment coming this way. So let me summarize the key points uh, that were presented in this news report. First, here we see a case when um, a German company invested money in the United States, in New York State, to create a company that makes um, AC units. The uh, company employs about 200 people, which is a good thing for the New York State because um, it's jobs. The news report also mentioned that uh, about 3 million people in the United States work in jobs that are a result of foreign direct investment. It's also important to notice uh, that the New York state government offered a state grant, Empire State Grant, for the company to come and establish itself in New York. What that means is that many states, local uh, governments, <clears throat> sometimes even perhaps federal government, but more likely the local ones, 
offer real money for the foreign companies to come and do business in the United States. So in the news report here, they wouldn't mention how much, but probably it's a substantial amount of money that attracted this company specifically to New York. As you can imagine, they could have established that company in China or somewhere else, but they also mentioned uh, the unemployment rate <coughs> in the United States at this time is fairly high. And by uh, basing their business here, they uh, have access to all those people who have factory experience who were laid off in the recession and now are ready, able and willing to work. Now, let me give you also some statistics on foreign direct investment. <clears throat> so uh, from the video case that we just saw, as we can see, it's kind of a good thing, right? So, I mean, there are not many problems with that, though there are some things that people don't like and we'll discuss them in a few minutes. But first, some statistics. Uh, a few maps that show how foreign direct investment has been changing over time, where it went, where it came from, uh, its size. For example, here is a map that compares the 1980 and 1998 size of the foreign direct investment and location or target locations of foreign direct investments. <clears throat> As you can see, uh, the sizes of the bubbles show you how much money is being invested uh, overseas. And as you can see in the 1980s, uh, so 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago actually by now, most of the investment went into North America, into Europe and pretty much nowhere else. A little bit in uh, Australia and a little bit in Southeast Asia. Just 15, 20 years later, as you can see, the size of foreign direct investment increased dramatically. I mean, the bubbles are much bigger and there are many more of them. And yes, Europe and North America are still the main recipients of foreign direct investment. But notably, you also see India and China uh, and Asia in general, as well as Latin America emerging as big recipients of um, foreign direct investment. Now, here are a few other uh, examples. This one as the percent of the GDP, so it doesn't show you how much in absolute terms, but how much relative to the country's economy uh, a foreign direct investment goes where. And again, as you can see, it's primarily North America and Australia, uh, but also Latin America as well as some countries in Africa. And the reason uh, these countries are shown here on this map, but were not shown on the previous map, is because the amounts are small small in terms of the dollars dollar values but since since those economies are small as a percent of the percentage of the economy those are huge numbers so you have a number of countries here that um, are dark blue so which means for them the numbers may be small but it's a huge portion of their total economy all right now this is how the picture looks in 2000 so um, two decades later as you can see, the picture now includes uh, some of the post-Soviet Union countries, China, Kazakhstan notably, uh, Latin America even more so, and uh, New Zealand, right? 2004, the picture gravitates even more towards uh, China and then Asia in general, though again, North America and Europe still remain major recipients of foreign direct investment. And yes, while we hear a lot about jobs going to China, uh, the truth is that the business climate is still much more favorable in Europe and North America, much more predictable, safer, uh, fairer, and uh, so money seeks those kinds of things. So while uh, China is on the news lately, uh, it doesn't mean that Europe or North America are not getting much investment from overseas. Uh, here is again a uh, general foreign direct investment index uh, from 2011. So those are the latest figures I could find. Again, the yellow colors show you the main countries or countries that have the most um, foreign direct investment. And as you can see again, uh, North America, Europe, but also China, India, as well as some other countries. And orange is the biggest, uh, uh, orange culture, uh, countries on this map are the biggest recipients of foreign direct investment. And as you can see, remarkably, those are things that you wouldn't expect, like Japan, New Zealand, some parts of Latin America and Africa. Now, let's take a look at how FDI flows change over time. Here is a map of the FDI level around the entire world over time. 
As you can see first, uh, FDI has dramatically increased over time. So if in the 70s or 80s there was virtually no foreign direct investment going in, you know, from a country to a country, in the 90s this, these numbers started growing rapidly. But then in 2001, following the economic crisis, FDI went sharply down. Then as the recovery, as the economy was recovering, it went sharply up. Then in 2008, again, the economy tanked, FDI went down. And again, as the economy started improving again uh, in 2009, 2010, we saw an increased FDI worldwide. So the two followed together. Economy goes up, FDI goes up. Economy goes down. FDI goes down, which kind of makes sense. When the economic times are good, when the economic prospects are good, companies invest more, start new businesses, so make foreign direct investment. And vice versa, when the economy shrinks, companies stop investing. Makes perfect sense, right? Uh, also, what is FDI? It's very important to remember that FDI is not only um, starting new companies, but also buying companies. So you can invest your money overseas by completely building a new company, what we call a green field investment. So you literally buy a green field and you invest money and build a company from the ground up. Or you can acquire an existing company. And so when you look at the FDI dynamics over time, right? And when you look at the dynamics of mergers and acquisitions over time, you will see the two are virtually identical. So a huge, huge portion of FDI is actually mergers and acquisitions. And the two go together because, you know, in most cases when you buy a company, it's not quite clear is it's whether it's an acquisition, one company bought another or two companies merged. I guess in the sense it's, you know, a definition question, but on paper it looks the same. One company acquires another and so they now are together, right? Now here is a question just to make sure that you've been following me. So which of these is true about foreign direct investment? So A is clearly not true. It hasn't been increasing steadily. There have been ups and downs, right? So yes, the correct answer is FDI follows economic cycle. It goes up when the economy goes up and it goes down when the economy goes down, right? A few more numbers. Uh, here are some numbers on the United States in terms of um, does the United States invest more overseas or foreign partners invest more in the United States. Um, you can see that normally the United States gets a little bit more investment that it does, that it makes overseas, but the numbers, the difference is not really that huge. The point here is that the United States invests a lot and receives a lot. And it's more or less the same picture for most countries. So most countries would be both receiving and investing, especially developed countries. Let me give you a few pictures uh, that illustrates the, uh, illustrate this better. So uh, here, for example, you have again a picture for the United States and it's foreign direct investment. And that's against the GDP growth. So going back to our story, how the foreign direct investment follows the economic cycle, you see exactly the same picture in the United States as you saw in the world. So when the economy in the United States was growing, the FDI, so when the growth was positive, the FDI was also going up. When the economy tanked, the FDI went down. So exactly the same story for the United States, and you will probably see it for every other uh, country. In terms of who invests in the United States and how they invest in the United States, well, surprisingly, most of the foreign direct investment goes into manufacturing. So we love to complain here in the United States about how the manufacturing jobs are going to Asia or maybe Eastern Europe. Well, the truth is that most of the foreign direct investment, so most of the investments that foreign companies make into the United States, it is precisely in manufacturing. Like that news report about the German company that was manufacturing. So that's a very typical case. So pretty much half of all the investment, uh, investment goes into manufacturing. Who invests in the United States? Well, not surprisingly, the rich countries. <coughs> There is one important thing that you need to notice here. 
well, the United Kingdom as the main recipient, I mean, investor kind of makes sense. I mean, given the ties between the United States and uh, the UK, this is no surprise. Canada being much, much smaller in size, still invests a huge portion. So it's a whole 7.6%, which is quite remarkable. But note here you have Switzerland and you have Luxembourg as the two major investors in the United States. What really here is the case is that it's not really that there are companies in Switzerland and Luxembourg that make investment in, in the United States. Chances are those are companies that are in reality um, non-Swiss or Luxembourgian companies. Those are companies that are maybe even American or perhaps European that are registered in Switzerland and Luxembourg for known tax haven, you know, uh, protective uh, reasons. And uh, so the money literally may be going from the United States into the United States, but through those offshore centers. And so on paper, it looks as if uh, Switzerland or Luxembourg made the investment. Uh, if you look, for example, at the former Soviet Union republics, uh, especially uh, Ukraine, Russia, uh, so the ones that have more problems with corruption. And when you look at the foreign direct investment, guess what countries invest most in those countries? Like literally we are talking about 80% of all foreign direct investment comes from a particular set of countries. So for Russia, that's Cyprus. So that's again a foreign tax uh, haven. And uh, if you trace the money, you will see that those are Russian oligarchs, Russian businessmen who keep their money in tax havens and who make investments in their own country, but through their tax havens. And so it looks like foreign direct investment. For Ukraine, it's more or less the same, but for some reason, Ukrainian oligarchs like Austria more. So Austria becomes the biggest investor. But again, it's not really an Austrian businessman who decided to invest in Ukraine make that investment. No, those are usually Ukrainian, maybe sometimes Russian uh, business people who keep their money in those offshore accounts and then make investments uh, in their own companies or in their own uh, economies. Same thing for the United States, as you can see the huge portion of Switzerland, Luxembourg and the United Kingdom, by the way, that also has some offshore um, um, centers or jurisdictions like the um, British Virgin Islands and some other areas. So that's through where most of the money goes, even though part of it, or probably most of it, is not exactly from those tiny states, uh, they are more, more likely than not are either also from the United States or from some other countries. Just keep that in mind. Now, final and very interesting observation on the flows of foreign direct investment. Uh, here you have a picture of uh, China and India. And so for China, what's remarkable is that in 2000, uh, through pretty much all of the 2000s, uh, most of the investment or most of the FDI inflows versus outflows were going into China. So as you can see in 2000, China was a recipient of a lot of money but didn't make much investments overseas itself. So the classic story was that American or European companies open subsidiaries in China, build factories and uh, make products there, right? And China receives that money and uses its people to make the product. Now, over time, as you can see, the picture started changing. So more and more investment is going from China to somewhere else. So Chinese businessmen becoming stronger, wealthier, and now they are able to make foreign uh, direct investment. So they are able to invest, have enough cash capital to invest it overseas. And remarkably, in 2014, for the first time, China actually invests more overseas than receives from overseas. China primarily invests now a lot in Africa and Australia, as well as all around Asia, but also a lot and more and more in Europe and America. So it's kind of interesting that you see more and more Chinese companies or Chinese owned companies in these regions, including, as I said, the remarkably and historically strong regions like Europe and North America. Similar trends can be observed in India, though there was a little reversal here, reversal here, but about three years ago, India was actually investing more overseas 
than receiving from overseas. And so that coincided with some big mergers and acquisitions uh, when Tata Motors and Middle Steel were buying, Indian companies were buying big brands overseas. Then the uh, picture re re uh, reversed back and now India receives more money than invests. But still, this may change any time. But still, in either case, it doesn't mean that the foreign direct investment stopped flowing into these countries. As you can see, both uh, inflows and outflows are going up. So what changes here is that um, they invest more and more and much faster those investments grow than the income in foreign direct investments. Uh, now, finally, who has the most money invested overseas? So who has the most holdings overseas? And uh, clearly that's the United States by, by a huge margin. So the United States uh, has a lot of money overseas. And uh, so it's basically the biggest foreign owner of companies around the world. Um, so followed by France, the United Kingdom, Germany, and Netherlands, which is not surprising given that all of these used to be large empires and uh, have a long, long history, centuries of history of uh, international trade. So um, these companies definitely, I mean, these countries are not surprising on top of the list. Plus, obviously, size matters. The only thing that I would like to notice here is um, Hong Kong and China are differentiated on these graphs, so they are shown as separate countries. Uh, technically, now Hong Kong is uh, part of the United—I mean of China—and uh, technically, these two numbers should be added up. And once you add them up, uh, China basically um, climbs up the ladder, and so it becomes not quite first, the first investor, but it goes up to third, fourth position, right? So likewise, who holds uh, the investment in the United States? The picture is very, very similar, right? Unfortunately, I don't have the numbers for all the countries of the world. I wish I could provide them for my native Ukraine, perhaps, I don't know, for some European countries like Lithuania and Germany, but you can easily research them online. Um, the trends would be very similar to what we discussed here. Now, here is another question for you. And the answer clearly is A. There are currently more FDI dollars in the United States than any other country, right? Right here. <clears throat> now, let's talk about whether or not FDI is good or bad. You have um, two big questions here. If you believe that FDI is good, and again, most people believe that FDI is good, it's kind of okay when other companies, countries invest in your country, though there are, again, some concerns about that because some people see that as a modern uh, form of enslavement. Oh, you know, all our companies now are owned by, let's say, Americans. So uh, we're going to work for them and we, they're going to reap the benefits. So we'll talk about those concerns later. But if you believe that jobs are good and it doesn't matter who owns the company as long as the company creates jobs and creates good products, if you believe FDI is good, then the question becomes how do you attract FDI or where does most FDI go and why? All right. So let's talk about those. Well, first of all, why does FDI occur? Why do some companies or countries choose to invest overseas? Why not just create businesses here where we live? If I'm now in North Carolina, why would I want to invest somewhere else? Why would not uh, open a company right here in North Carolina? Well, there are all kinds of reasons, as you can imagine. So you have uh, the supply factors, so proximity to resources. What if my business requires me uh, to have access to, I don't know, oil or, or timber or some other resources? I probably want to build my factory where that product is, right? Low labor cost, I mean, the United States is a wonderful country to invest in, but labor here is expensive. Uh, the wage, the minimum wage is around $10, and in some states much higher than that. It's a lot of money per hour, right? If I went to, for example, Ukraine or Lithuania or, or China, it can be a fraction of that. So um, I would do that, and uh, so I would open a factory there so I can employ cheaper labor. Availability of skilled labor. 
again sometimes for some jobs it's not about how cheap the people are it's about what they can do and so in many cases you might want to open the company in germany or the united states where you have people with you know skills that you need access to key technology again if you want to make movies you probably want to be in hollywood if you want to make uh, cars you probably want to be in detroit if you want to make robots you, uh, robots, you probably want to be in Tokyo. And so that may uh, determine where you build your company. Same thing, access to the customers. I mean, if you make a product that is specifically designed for customers in, let's say, Germany, then you might want to have the company there so that the product is made right where it's sold. Same thing with America, for example. Why there are so many Japanese and South Korean companies here? Well, because that's where they sell their product. So why would you want to make it in Asia and then transport it to the United States when you can make it right here and sell it here and thereby avoid paying import taxes or tariffs and uh, uh, circumvent other um, uh, trade barriers. Marketing advantage. Uh, it's no secret that pretty much in every country people believe that it's patriotic to buy local. So in America people love buying American stuff. In uh, China people love buying Chinese, Chinese stuff or at least they feel good about it. In Ukraine there are actually whole websites where you can find producers of Ukrainian products so that you can feel good about yourself and buy Ukrainian. And so many companies would specifically establish their operations in the target markets so that they could say proudly made in Germany and France and whatever country you're talking about. And finally, the, the economic factors. Again, sometimes there are import tariffs. So if you make the product inside the country, you don't have to pay the import tariff. And that may be 20 and maybe even more percent. That's a huge saving, right? Economic development incentives. Again, if you open your company in some countries, including in the United States, you can negotiate preferential taxes. You can negotiate better taxes, subsidies, loans, free land, infrastructure subsidies, all kinds of other concessions. And finally, sometimes your operations may not be that expensive, but the taxes that you have to pay on your operations or profits, that's what matters. And so many companies uh, incorporate overseas where taxes are low, and that's why you see so many companies registered in the tax havens, right? <clears throat> Now, remember, we talked about the international product, product life cycle, right? So, like, for example, we talked about computers, how they used to be made in the United States, but for, for the United States and for the world. And then as the product became more mature and more standardized, the United States tended to outsource production to you know, like China or the Philippines and uh, uh, buy the computers from there. So like Dell, HP, American companies, Apple, all make their computers overseas uh, rather than in America as they used to. Well, clearly that's how the FDI also works. So when the computers were made here, most of the foreign direct investment in that computer industry was made here in the United States or into the United States as uh, the product matured and it became easier and easier to make that product and it became irrelevant where exactly you make it, the production started moving east to Asia and with that the money because foreign direct investment it's not only the cash that you can use to build a factory but also the equipment that you can literally physically take from one location and move to another. doesn't really matter if it's capital or uh, money or, or, or machinery, it's still foreign direct investment. And so as you can imagine, as the products production sites move to countries with low labor costs, uh, so does FDI. Now, taxes is a big, big factor. Uh, when you will be doing business, and sooner or later most of you will own a business or work for one, uh, taxes will be your big factor and you obviously want to make your product in a country where taxes are lower, right? And so here is how taxes look like when you uh, compare the world. So the purple lines are the corporate taxes and the green line is the personal taxes. So as you can see, taxes vary dramatically from a country to country, from anywhere between 15% all the way to about 16. So first let's talk about personal taxes. Huge difference. For example, personal tax on average in Korea is only about 15%. So if you make, let's say, $100,000 a year, you pay about $15,000 in taxes. 
in Belgium, Germany, France, in Europe in general, especially in Northern Europe, it's a whooping 50 to 60 percent. I mean, it's huge. You make $100,000 and you give half of that back to the state. So the difference is huge. You as an employer may be paying the same hourly wage or annual salary to your people, but of that money, they may see a very different uh, amount of dollars. So for every $100 that you pay in, for example, South Korea, Mexico, uh, New Zealand, people will keep about $80. For every $100 that you pay or euros that you pay, for example, in Europe, people will see only about 50. So you pay the same, but the difference in the actual amount of money that people get may be 30, 40, or even 50%. Huge difference, right? How does the United States compare it to the rest of the world? Um, it's okay in terms of personal taxes. So it's about 27, 28%. So my salary um, compared to, for example, the United States versus Canada, it's roughly the same. Here in these countries, uh, your income, personal income tax uh, also depends on where you live. So the federal tax is only about 20 something, 22, 23%. So for every $100 that you earn, you give up only about $20. But then on top of that, you have the state income tax and those vary dramatically from a state to state. Here in North Carolina, it's about 7%. So uh, an additional $7 for every 100 that I earn, I give to the state. Um, in, for example, Texas, Wyoming, Florida, uh, a few other states, Alaska, there is no state income tax. So effectively, they kind of make 7% more or so. Now, on top of that, in the United States, as well as in Canada, the tax is um, progressive, meaning that the more you money you make, the more taxes you pay. So in my tax bracket, I pay uh, quite a lot. If you were making much less, let's say $20,000 a year, your uh, taxes would be virtually zero. Well, there will be some, but they will be very, very low. In Canada, uh, I was in Alberta before I moved to North Carolina, and um, in Alberta, there is no state income tax or per, uh, provincial, provincial income tax. So in Alberta, my tax was actually somewhat lower in Canada than it is now here in North Carolina in the United States. If I lived in Quebec, for example, the French-speaking province of Canada, there the taxes are huge, very high, almost like in Europe. So they're not quite 50-60%, but they're much, much higher than they are in Western Canada. So if I went from there, let's say, to Florida, then my tax in Canada would be probably twice as high as it would be in uh, Florida. So it depends dramatically where you live exactly in one of these big countries as opposed to what country you are in, because as I said, I paid less in Canada than I pay in the United States just because where I lived in Canada and where I live in the United States. So in Europe, as you can see, taxes are much higher and usually about 40 something percent. And uh, when I was in the job market seven years ago, when I was looking for a job after graduating with my PhD degree, I was looking at Europe. I mean, all my friends, family at that time, or most of my friends and family were in Europe. Um, so I wanted to, you know, I would, would seriously consider going to Europe. But when I looked at taxes, I mean, that's a huge difference. I mean, for the same job, first of all, in Europe, the salaries are smaller to start with. But then you look at the taxes and you literally, for the same job, get half the money. It's also important to notice, though, and it's, it's hugely important, that in Europe you get much more for your taxes. You get free health care, and here in the United States you don't. Uh, in Europe, you also get much, much cheaper education for your kids, and here in the U.S. you don't. Uh, for example, uh, a few weeks ago, um, over the Christmas break, so it's a few weeks, weeks ago, two months ago, my son broke both of his arms. And so he now has had three surgeries, and there will be more, at least one more. And even though I have a good health insurance, it's a huge cost to me. So first, I pay about $6,000 for my health insurance out of my pocket for my family. <clears throat> so it's about 450 or so uh, $100 every month. It's regardless of whether or not I see a doctor, it's just my insurance premium. On top of that, the employer pays a huge portion of that, roughly twice as much on my behalf for my family. So mine 100% and my family's, I believe it's half of that. So uh, the actual cost to me is then not only, not 6,000, but more like $18,000 a year.
so that's the money that could have been added to my salary but now it's taken from me in the form of insurance payments part paid by my employer instead of paying it to me and part paid by me so you can consider that a tax so even though it's not part of the tax effectively i'm giving up that money on top of that every time i see my doctor i pay uh i believe it's uh 40 dollars or something like that to see my uh, family physician who normally just doesn't do anything just you know refers you to someone else if you are referred to some someone else you pay another I believe it's $100 now so you have cold or you have some you know minor condition you are easily out of $130 just to see the doctor on top of that the drugs the medication can be anywhere between 10 to $50 depending on how bad it is or much much more if it's something more you know serious uh, now my son, as I said, broke both of his arms. The bills are, I don't even know how much it is. It's, it's like in tens of thousands of dollars. My insurance covers everything above about $5,000 a year. So since my son broke his arms right before the new year, so I reached my maximum last year and I reached my maximum this year. So which means I'm paying at least $10,000 for his, you know, uh, surgeries and stuff like that. And as I said, the actual bill is much higher, just the insurance covers the rest. So if you take that as a tax, because in Canada, for example, in Europe, it would have been all free, then taxes in the United States actually not that much lower than they are in, uh, in, in Europe. On top of that, my wife is a student, and again, education here is extremely expensive, so it's thousands of dollars per semester, and at some schools it may be tens of thousands of dollars per semester. Again, in Europe, uh, it would be virtually nothing. It's a few hundred uh, dollar, U I mean, a few hundred euros. In Canada, it would be not quite as cheap as in Europe, but substantially cheaper than in the United States. So again, as a person who pays for my family member's education, that's a huge loss. So once you factor those things in, I actually, yes, in the United States, taxes are lower, but what you have in your pocket after you pay all your medical, uh, insurance, education bills, it's probably very close to what Europeans have left in their pockets. So while taxes are lower, it doesn't necessarily make Americans much richer. There may be some advantage, but not as huge as it looks like. Now, when you look at the corporate taxes, the story is very different. The corporate tax in the United States is actually one of the highest in the world. It's 35% uh, and it's higher only in Japan by like a fraction of a percent. And uh, it's kind of high close to that in Germany. But everywhere else it's substantially lower. So for example, you look at so-called socialist Canada and it's several percentage points lower than in the United States on average. You look at the European countries and it's much, much lower. And you look at some countries like Ireland, like uh, Slovakia, Slovak Republic, Czech Republic, Hungary, it's actually literally half of what it is, for example, in the United States. So for you as a business owner, it becomes an important issue. First, uh, what taxes will you pay on your profits? Well, if you incorporate in Ireland, you will pay less than half of what you would be paying in the United States. In fact, it's actually only about one third. And that's why there are so many American companies that have offices in Ireland so that they can pay lower taxes. For example, Google has offices in Ireland and other high profile companies. <coughs> So it's a big deal and many companies choose to go to these low tax countries specifically so that they can pay lower taxes. Um, at the same time, if you are in one of those countries, you may be paying uh, more in taxes for your employees. But then again, as a business owner, you just, you know, you pay what you have to pay. So it still may make sense to you because, you know, the employees are used to that level of taxes. So keep that in mind, and when you decide to incorporate a business somewhere, I mean, I sure hope you will <laughs> incorporate it in the country where I will be living at that time, here in the United States, or maybe in Canada, or who knows, maybe in Ukraine or somewhere in Europe. Um, but do your math, do your math. Now, trade barriers. It's especially relevant if uh, you are targeting a particular market. So, for example, uh, you would often see pictures that look like this. You see pictures of the U.S.-Mexico border and uh, you will see that there are a lot of what looks like production facilities in Mexico 
and none of them on the US border. What that is, is the following. Keep in mind, because, uh, I mean, listen carefully, because it's a very, very common trend. So as you know, since 1994, right, uh, Mexico, the United States, and Canada are in NAFTA, so North uh, American Free Trade Agreement Treaty, right? And uh, if you make the product in one of these three countries, you can sell it in any of the three countries uh, without paying any import tariffs. So if you make your products in China, for I mean in Mexico, for example, you can sell those products in the United States without paying any taxes or any import tariffs. Now, many foreign companies uh, want to make uh, products for the United States market. And if they make it in their home countries, like in Korea or in Japan, they would be paying import taxes on these products because they're made overseas. If those products were made in Mexico, on the other hand, you don't have to pay import tariffs because it's part of NAFTA. So what many foreign companies do, they would build their factories right here in Mexico, right on the U.S.-Mexico uh, border, like you see on the picture, and they would uh, make products in Mexico using cheap Mexican labor as well as lower paying lower Mexican taxes and then just transport the products across the border, tax-free, tariff-free, and sell them in the United States. Often you would even have the management of the company living in the United States, so they would literally cross the border every morning going into Mexico, and then at night go back to the United States, like San Diego or other cities close to the border. And uh, so here the operations are specifically designed to make products to be sold in the United States, but they are physically located in Mexico, so you can get access to the cheaper Mexican labor. Uh, often, and a good portion of those companies are actually American companies who literally moved and established themselves over, you know, uh, on the southern side of the border so that they can employ cheaper Mexican workers, but then the products go back to the United States. There is really nothing wrong with, with that from the economic point of view. I mean, yes, those companies sometimes are blamed for not being patriotic because, you know, you should be employing Americans, giving uh, jobs to your fellow citizens instead of employing people of a different country. But again, by moving production to Mexico where labor is cheaper, companies can make cheaper products and we, the consumers, can buy them for less. So a mouse like this made in Mexico will probably cost a few dollars less than if it was made in the, the United States. And I'm happy to pay less. So if I pay less, I don't really care that much where it's made as long as I can save some money. So I can use those savings to buy other products, probably American-made products. So in the end, it actually doesn't diminish the number of jobs in the United States because the savings translate into demand for other products, many of which are made in the United States product services, which translates, uh, translates in jobs in the United States. So we love to have jobs here, but we also love to have cheaper products. And uh, both are important economic effects, and it's not even clear what is more patriotic. Is it more patriotic to make products for more, but in America, or to make products for less and give your fellow American citizens uh, um, a discount. Sometimes the location matters a lot to the consumer. For example, when you buy a car or when you buy some sort of a generic product, people are, care, uh, are concerned about the price but not much else. So if you offer me a, I don't know, Toyota Camry uh, for Twenty-five thousand versus fifteen thousand, and one is made in the United States, the other one is made in Mexico. It's the same car, same specs, same everything. I would buy the cheaper one. But sometimes the location of the production site matters a lot, and people are willing to pay more just because it's made there. So, for example, luxury arm watches, like the one you see here on the picture. Uh, there is this aura of the Swiss uh, watchmakers, you know, being much better than everybody else. And so Swiss watches cost more than 
an identical watch made, for example, in China. There is no reason to believe that one made in Switzerland is of better quality or, or will show you more exact time. I mean, today those things are basically you know, commodities. I mean, a two-dollar arm watch from China, you know, the basic technology is as accurate as the most expensive uh, arm watch from from Switzerland. But if you want to charge thousands of dollars for your arm watches, you have to make them in Switzerland. And so sometimes, uh, foreign direct investment and relocation to cheaper countries just doesn't work. Now here is a question for you to see if you've been following me. And the answer clearly is B. Increase horizontal FDI into NAFTA. Why? Because NAFTA, the United States is part of NAFTA, and if there is an import tariff, there is an incentive to make products inside NAFTA, either in the United States or Mexico or Canada, and sell that product in the United States so that uh, you don't have to pay import tariffs. <coughs> Now, another reason for foreign direct investment is what we call vertical integration. Sometimes you want to integrate, to own the entire production process. I'm going to use the oil industry here as an example, but um, it applies to other industries as well. So, in the oil industry, before you can have the final product, let's say, for example, your gas, gasoline, right, tanked in your car, you have to go through a number of steps. First, you have to do research and exploration and find where the oil is in the ground. Then you need to extract oil. Then you need to transport the oil to the refineries. Then you have to refine it into gas and other products. Then you have to transport that final product, like gas, to the gas stations. And then finally you have to sell it at the gas stations. Not so long ago, uh, both in Europe as well as in the United States, most of the gas stations were owned by families. Those were small gas stations. And uh, you would, you know, have all kinds of names. Like in the United States, you would have like Bob's Corner Gas Station, for example, Corner Gas. So, in fact, now in the United States, when you go to small rural, rural uh, towns, you would still see those small family-owned uh, gas stations slash stores. More and more lately, though, you see brand name gas stations. And so what that means is that the oil companies have incorporated, vertically integrated the entire production process. So now Exxon, for example, Mobil, <coughs> they do both um, exploration, but then they would also have their own um, uh, oil rigs that pump the oil. They would have their own tankers that transport the oil from the production site or uh, extraction site to the refinery. They would own their own refineries, they would have their own trucks that transport the oil, and they would also own their own gas stations, or at least have some sort of a franchising uh, uh, type of deal. And so 20, 30, 50 years ago, it wasn't like that. So oil companies would focus on oil production, uh, refineries would be owned by someone else and would refine the oil, uh, gas stations would be owned by someone else. As they were integrating this process and acquiring all the phases of the production cycle, they were buying companies or sometimes creating new ones. And so that's where much of the investment was going overseas. So uh, it could be an American company, but now it acquired a chain of gas stations overseas or perhaps a tanker that is uh, flying somebody else's flag. So all that acquisition uh, was part of the, or basically was foreign direct investment. <clears throat> it's also important to notice or remember that uh, China, India, and other developing countries are not 
who are no longer just the recipients of foreign direct investment. Remember, we looked at the dynamics at the graphs and uh, we talked about how China used to receive all the foreign direct investment. So Western companies from Europe, from, from America, were investing and opening businesses in um, China. But it's no longer the case. Today, for example, China invests like crazy overseas. China buys all kinds of uh, international brands and companies and opens its subsidiaries all around the world. Same thing applies to India. So here are some recent high-profile acquisitions like IBM, no longer an American company, it's a Chinese company. Well, IBM itself is still an American company, but the personal computer division was bought by China. Land Rover is now an Indian company. <clears throat> there are many Chinese oil companies in the Middle East and Canada, more and more. Plus, there are lots of startups. So these countries, now that they've accumulated enough capital, they are moving international, and more and more you would see them. Jaguar uh, is also now an Indi Indian company. So uh, all those things, you know. So there is also a very interesting optional reading in your readings, if you're taking my course of credit. Uh, titled um, Aus uh, Australia Gets Money, China Gets Australia. So it's about how much money from China is going to Australia and it's kind of driving the economic growth in Australia. But at the same time, uh, there are concerns that more and more wealth and natural resources of Australia uh, belong to Chinese companies now. <clears throat> Now, when you decide to open a business overseas, one of the big challenges you have is what form of investment uh, you want to make. Are you going to open your own fully owned subsidiary or are you just want to sell your license? Uh, do you want to just sell your license to a foreign company that will use your technology but make products on their own? Or do you want to have some sort of a joint venture where you own something and invest something and your local partner owns something and invest something? <clears throat> the choice here is basically uh, between risk and control. The more you own, the more control you have over how you make, uh, how you make your products. But at the same time, the more risk you assume because you have to pay a lot up front and if it fails, you lose a lot of money. So here is another look at how uh, risk and um, control play out in 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 this uh, you know type of uh, continuum so it's not only about risk per se but it's also about flexibility it's about resource commitment and about control over the resources so for example if you make some sort of a simple product and it's easy to make you probably don't need all that control your local partner will be able to make it equally well so you might want to sell just you know a license or maybe uh, you know some sort have some sort of an agreement where you have little control over how stuff that is done uh, locally but if it's some sort of a proprietary type of tool like if you're making your own brand computers and you don't want to uh, your local partners to know you know what your technologies and know-hows are you might want to have a wholly owned subsidiary so that you keep all the knowledge to yourself and you control the entire process because again flexibility is one of the things here so on the one hand you want to own as much as possible so you can make all the decisions on the other hand you know if something goes wrong and you own a factory and you own thousands of people or uh, employ thousands of people and own uh, all kinds of equipment not so easy to get out whereas if you simply have a contract with a local company something goes wrong you can always change a supplier you can always change uh, you know cancel the contract so it's definitely much more fle flexible for you um, Likewise, do you want to go with a green field? So uh, start and build the company from ground up. Do you want to merge with an existing company or do you want to acquire an existing company? Again, likely it's a matter of risk and control. In theory, it sounds very good to go with a green field. You build your factory from ground up, you uh, design your buildings, you put new equipment in them, you create new organizational culture, you hire your employees and you decide how they behave, what they do, everything is wonderful. On the other hand, um, 
it just takes a lot of time and sometimes costs a lot of money. I'll give you my example. I had a company that was a little car dealership slash repair shop back, you know, years ago. And um, I didn't have enough money to uh, go with the greenfield, uh, so I didn't have enough money to actually build the facility. So I decided to rent. And so I found a company that had uh, what I need, like, you know, big repair shops and some land in front of them. So it was a perfect uh, type of deal for me. So I was paying some money every month, but I could start doing business right away. Technically, it was still a greenfield company because, you know, uh, even though I acquired or rented the buildings, uh, I started everything else more or less from scratch. Obviously, I was still bound by, you know, what kind of equipment was available there, what kind of, you know, structures I had, and I probably would have done it differently if I had to do it from the scratch. But, you know, there was still um, a lot of flexibility for me to start with. The problem is that at the time when I acquired uh, or started renting that facility, uh, it already operated as a, as a repair shop for cars. And I already had a number of mechanics that worked there. And so I was young at that time, I was like, I don't know, 23 or so. And I show up and I basically am the new owner of that, you know, site. And uh, I wanted to start from scratch, I wanted to hire new people, but then I was faced with the problem that first it's not so easy to find good auto mechanics, uh, many of them at the same time, especially in a smaller town. I mean, a good auto mechanic is, is, a, is a catch, it's, you know, it's a, it's a rare commodity. So while there are many people who know something about cars, to find one who is reliable, who is knowledgeable, may not be as easy as it looks. Second, uh, the people who were working at that time there, I mean, for them, that pretty much would have meant, you know, being laid off. And while I did have the right to do that and I could have done that, I mean, I kind of felt sorry for them. One of them just got married and so they, there were all kinds of, you know, things going on there. And uh, I was, you know, soft hearted and I thought, well, sure, yeah, I'll keep them. Turns out they had this organizational culture where, you know, uh, the customers would be paying them directly for the work they do. And uh, for me, there was really no way to see um, how much money they received. And uh, so uh, I noticed that I was not getting much revenue based on how many cars I see were going through the shop. And I started suspecting that they're just not showing the entire revenue to me. Sometimes they would get the money from the customer and they would tell me that, you know, they did only a tiny little bit, you know, of job and it was half of what they actually were paid. And so after fighting with them back and forth, for about a year, I guess, I had no choice but literally to fire them all and then hire new people. And uh, when I did that, that's when uh, finally I started seeing revenues um, that were much larger. So dealing with an existing organizational culture may be a big, big challenge. But then again, as I said, not everyone has the resources to start with a green field. I mean, it, it takes a lot of money and resources to build a company. On top of that, as I said, it's also a matter of time. Even if you had all the money that you need, it will still take a lot of time. And in many cases, it will not be easy to find enough employees uh, to, to start your business. So a merger or an acquisition uh, or some other sort of agreement may be a preferred way to go. Though, again, uh, all those organizational cultural clashes, resistance, sabotage, are the things that you probably will be dealing with unless your deal is much better than what they had with the previous owner. Now, is FDI good or bad for America? And I'm going to talk here about America, but if you happen to be from a different country, you can ask yourself uh, that. So, is it good or bad for Canada? Is it good or bad for Germany? Is it good or bad for Ukraine, for Lithuania, for Japan, for China? Well, there are several things here. <clears throat> One, is it expansion or relocation? If um, your business in your country or some sort of a company in your country decided to go overseas, it depends whether or not they decided to expand there or if they decided to relocate there. If you had a factory that was making some sort of products in your country, like these microphones, right? And they were making so many of them and they were so good that everybody on this planet wanted to buy them. So they decided to expand, but because now they will be selling not only in your own country, but also somewhere else, they decided to build a factory somewhere else. 
Sure, that's not a problem at all. That's wonderful. There are many companies that make many or most products overseas, like the Swiss Nestlé makes about 95% of its products uh, outside Switzerland. Like, for example, General Motors makes a lot of products in, for example, China and sells them in China. So that's growth. That's, that's not a problem. It's a whole different story when you have a company that was making products in your country and then literally closed a factory here, took all the equipment and moved it to a different country, laid off all the people here and moved all the equipment and all the factory over there. That's a loss. I mean, probably again, they did some math and probably they came to the conclusion that uh, economically it makes more sense to them that way to do business that way. And that's what you saw a lot in uh, the United States when many American companies were moving to Mexico, literally closing factories here like Flint, Michigan and moving to Mexico, right? So that is more concerning because there are people here who would be laid off. Uh, sometimes whole towns would be literally dying. If you've uh, watched that movie Talking to Roger or Roger and Me by uh, Michael Moore, uh, the one uh, about Flint, Michigan, uh, about a car factory, GM factory that had uh, its facilities in Flint, Michigan in the United States uh, making cars and then one day they just packed and went and created the same factory in Mexico. That's a problem. Flint was devastated. I mean, there was a whole town around that factory and when the factory left, uh, that was a huge problem for the entire town, for the entire county. Uh, so that would be a concern. So that's a, that's an issue. But then again, is it always a problem when factories move to a different country? Well, for once, you as a consumer probably get cheaper products as a result. Second, sometimes it's what we call a sunset industry relocation. Uh, in many cases, those would be factories that were making models of the cars, for example, that the local customers no longer want and no longer buy. For example, uh, GM, in the case of Flint, Michigan, uh, the factory there was making older models of Chevy, Chevrolet, and it was just an outdated model, and all that equipment was designed to make that particular model. Uh, so Americans wanted something new or something better, and uh, so GM literally moved that factory to Mexico, where people were still very happy to buy that older model, so uh, they can make room for new facilities here in the United States. And it just ha happened to be the case that they didn't open one right in that same town, but sometimes that what happens. So some products just become too old for developing co uh, developed countries, and so they just move the production to developing countries where there is still demand for that product. Plus, again, we talked about the cost, sav co cost saving, uh, cheaper labor, and all kinds of other reasons. And again, I mean, if you believe in free market, then why should you be against uh, companies going to where they can make the product cheaper? That makes perfect sense. Plus, again, sometimes companies move uh, to be closer to natural resources. And uh, if that happens, you know, <clears throat> well, I mean, it's it just an economic necessity. So it's kind of upsetting and you want it to be in your town so that they can create jobs where you live. But, you know, sometimes it's an economic necessity to move somewhere else. Uh, access to knowledge and networks. We talked about that, too. So sometimes... Uh, your product uh, needs to be in a what we call a production cluster. So if you want to make movies, you want to be in Hollywood. If you want to make uh, electronics, uh, you want to be probably in the Silicon Valley. If you want to make furniture, you want to be in North Carolina. If you want to grow tobacco, you probably want to be in North Carolina. And so in many cases, companies moved to those production clusters. Likewise, now more and more uh, electronics assembly is uh, taking place in China, uh, as well as in Hong Kong and some other places. So like, for example, Apple makes its computers, iPods, iPhones uh, at Foxconn. And uh, one of the reasons for that is that uh, the factories in Asia have perfected the, 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 the process of manufacturing and assembly. And they're really, really very good at that stuff. And so many companies would specifically move there so that they are close to the contractors, to the companies that can assemble that stuff for you. Uh, because, you know, not only it's much cheaper, they actually are more efficient and better at making that kind of stuff. Purchasing power, again, uh, if you are 
selling an expensive product uh, in countries where there are enough customers with enough money, you sometimes might want to be there to make products there. And so if you happen to make a product that is designed for, and we said, for example, for rich American clients, right, you probably want to be in America. Or if your product is uh, something that is uh, for relatively poor people, let's say, I don't know, for, for people in India, you know, simple, simple cars, bare bones, no special features, just, you know, like a Tata $2,000 car, it would be sold only in India, maybe in some neighboring poor countries. So you don't want to make those cars in Germany, for example, because you will have to transport them to where you will be selling them later on. So is it good or bad when um, a company buys a company in your country, for example? So is it good or bad for America when um, um, is it good for America when a Japanese company, for example, buys an American company? This one is not as easy to answer as it may look like. Uh, in many cases we are happy about foreign direct investment when it goes into your country. So, for example, Ukrainians are happy when foreigners open businesses in their country. Uh, Lithuanians are probably happy when, I don't know, if Mercedes-Benz decided to open a Mercedes-Benz factory in Lithuania. Americans probably would be happy when Toyota opens a factory in uh, the United States or Lexus factory in the United States. Uh, at the same time, many people are concerned that now the company is not locally owned. So if that happens on a large scale, and we saw that first in Mexico when many American businesses were opening their operations there, we saw that for sure in Europe when uh, uh, companies from uh, rich European, Western European countries were moving east to Eastern European countries. Uh, many people would say, well, now all those rich Europeans or Americans are buying our labor and we basically are doomed to work for them for the rest of our lives because look it's an American company it's an American company it's a European company here uh, where is all that Ukrainian stuff for example Russian stuff or Lithuanian stuff and so it becomes an issue because many people feel like they are being now owned by some other country um, in fact, now recently in Russia, uh, General Motors decided to leave Russia altogether. And many people were kind of, on the one hand, concerned about it because, it, you know, it's a bad sign for, for the economy. But on the other hand, they were kind of happy saying, well, we don't want Americans here. You know, we're going to make our stuff on our own. So enough uh, working for them. So now we're going to work for us. So is it good or bad when uh, a foreign company builds or better yet acquires your local company? Well, in order to answer this question, you should really think about what changes. All right, you had a company that was making microphones, all right? And uh, it was, let's say, American owned or whatever country you are in, uh, owned by your local authority. Now, let's say the Japanese come and buy your factories. Uh, is it good or bad? Well, let's see how it's going to affect employment. So are there going to be more people employed or fewer people employed? Are those going to be local people or they will bring their, let's say, Japanese people? Will that affect prices? Will you as a consumer still be able to buy that product? And if so, will it cost you more or less? Uh, quality. Will the quality improve or not? I mean, if you can still buy this microphone for the same price of the same quality, maybe you didn't lose so much. And if the quality improves and price goes down because maybe those Jap Japanese have better technology, maybe it's a good thing. Internal revenue. I mean, are they still going to be paying taxes in your country or are they going to be paying taxes in Japan? Well, if they offered or acquired your company, uh, that, that company in question in your own country, they will be paying taxes here. So technically, you shouldn't worry about who owns the company as long as the taxes are paid in full. Who cares what the paper says who the owner is? Is it going to be a better standard of living for the employees as well as for the customers? Uh, is the country, like for example the United States, will be able to influence political, uh, you know, uh, to have political influence in the world as a result, national security? Those are all important questions. 
So let's take a quick look at, uh, for example, the case when, let's say, Toyota bought General Motors. Uh, didn't happen, though at some time it looked like it could happen. But let's imagine that GM now became uh, Japanese. Well, at the emotional level, it would be a huge tragedy for many Americans. The American icon, General Motors, now became Japanese. I mean, that's a huge loss. What's happening here? I mean, that many people would be, you know, very, very upset about it. But let's look at what's going to change. Well, presuming that they bought GM but kept all the factories intact, intact and still make the same cars, maybe now with the Toyota logo on them, well, it's not going to change the payroll. It's still going to be the same number of people working at the same factory, just making probably the same cars, just, you know, for a different owner. But, you know, for as far as the employees, nothing's going to change. And there is no reason to believe that once they buy that factory, they will, I don't know, lay off people or start paying them differently, right? taxes. <clears throat> Again, the company would still would be in the United States, and so as a result, they would still be paying taxes in the United States, exactly the same amount of taxes, unless they will start making more or fewer products. But then again, there is no reason to believe that that will change much, or at least, you know, not as a result of, you know, the acquisition. And chances are, if they acquire the company, they probably will use it to the full potential. So that there is a good chance they may be making more and probably even paying more in taxes. Operation expenses, you know, when you run a company, you still have to pay for it, like electricity, for cleaning the floor, you know, for, for the janitorial services, so uh, uh, the cleaning crews, you know, paint the walls, uh, transportation, whatever else needs to be done around the factory to make it function. Well, the factory is here, so all that stuff will still be purchased in the United States, so the janitors would be American, the transportation people would be American, the painters who will paint the wall would be American, the electricity would be American, nothing really changes here. Marketing, I mean, if they bought the companies here in the United States, chances are they will be selling those cars here in the United States, chances are they will still market them using same American advertising agencies, so all those expenses will stay in the United States. Houses for executives, I mean, even if the company now is owned by Japanese, uh, by the Japanese, chances are the actual management, not only the employees, but the, the management, they may be people from Japan, but they would still still uh, live in the United States. So they would still be making the same spendings, you know, on houses and entertainment and whatever else. So the only difference could be uh, the profits, where the profits go. But again, just like with uh, the GM uh, that invested its profits all around the place, I mean, much of it in itself, you know, to grow, some of it went into all kinds of financial instruments, in most cases all around the world, chances are the portfolio of Toyota is not that different from the portfolio of, um, of uh, GM. And so, yes, potentially the new owners can take some of that profit, put it in their pocket and bring it to their own country and spend it there. So in that case, it may be a little loss. But more likely than not, you know, people, uh, owners of larger companies, I mean, they, they still keep their money globally. I mean, nobody keeps their money only in their own banks. They invested, uh, you know, in all kinds of financial instruments. So chances are you wouldn't see any difference. I mean, really, uh, you know, in the whole scheme of things, if anything, when you have an acquisition, it's probably because the new owner thinks that he can do better than the old owner, meaning that the company can be stronger and bigger, and that's what matters more than where you know, the profits uh, go. So it could be a concern, but when you think about it, it's not as big, not as problematic as many people feel it is. Um, other I mean, other considerations. Um, again, talking about the General Motors because it's such a you know um, um, salient example. Uh, just a few years ago, General Motors was uh, filed for bankruptcy and was going through very tough times. And at that time, it was not even clear if GM would survive. The same applies to Chrysler. Ford did a little better, but it was a tough time for for American automakers in general. 
As you know, eventually they were able to survive uh, due to what we call a bailout package. So the government, the US government gave them money, lots of money, we're talking about huge amounts of money, billions of dollars, and that money helped those companies go through the tough times. Eventually they got better and they paid the money back, so uh, no problem, but it was still quite an investment and quite a risk on behalf of the American government, which basically represents the American people. Uh, if Toyota decided to buy out GM, as they talked about uh, at some point, it would have been like a bailout package just at the expense of the Japanese company. So I wouldn't call that a big problem. I mean, if you have a problem, a company that experiencing is experiencing problems, and there is someone from overseas who believes he or she can sal salvage the company and manage it better, why not? I mean, it's much better than when the money is taken from my pocket and, you know, put there, right? Uh, the Japanese probably would be happy because, um, uh, you know, psychologically it feels good, plus they get access to all the, you know, patents and uh, um, know-hows and other resources GM has. So I suppose for them that would be a good thing. Uh, they will probably be concerned about all that investment, all that money going to America, because they would, there will be many who would say, you should have used that money to open a factory in, the, in, in Japan. But then again, I suppose they wouldn't be too upset about it, just like when an American company buys a huge company overseas. But again, these things are very emotional and hardly ever people think about them in the terms of, you know, dollars or, or uh, you know, access to resources. People kind of look at them as it's mine and now it's somebody else's. Though again, we talked about Nestle, so only about 2% of the revenue comes from Switzerland and only about 5% of the production of the company is in Switzerland. So you can talk about the Nestle company as a big trader because you know, oh, it's not patriotic. I mean, they're a Swiss company, but uh, how come do they make most of their money and most of their products overseas? Can you imagine how many more jobs they would have created in Switzerland had they relocated all their production facilities to Switzerland? On the other hand, Nestle is one of the best things that happened to, you know, Switzerland. I mean, sure, yes, they make almost all of their stuff overseas, but I mean, come on, wouldn't you want to have companies that uh, basically hold a huge global market share and uh, in a particular product and maybe make and sell products all around the world but still are incorporated in your country. I mean, they still pay a huge portion of their taxes in Switzerland. So uh, I don't see a problem with that. <clears throat> now, here is a commercial that BMW aired in the United States a few years ago. Does it make sense that a German car company would break ground in Spartanburg, South Carolina and call it home? Does it make sense that in the height of recession, when most companies were bailing out, that they would dig in, that they would find their latest design in California and customize it in 10 million different ways? Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Does it make sense? That a small town in the South would make every X3, every X3 in the world. It makes perfect sense. The all new BMW X3. Designed in America, built in America. So you probably will not see an advertisement like that in Germany. Germans don't want to know that their BMWs are made in America. They want them to be made in Germany. But BMW wants to sell cars in America and to look local American, to appeal to American patriotic, uh, you know, fibers, you know, emotions. They have a commercial like that. Does it make sense to build cars in America? Of course it does. BMW, designed in America, built in America. So this is one of those, you know, emotional slash business issues that I was talking about. Irony of, of the FDI is, uh, the irony of the FDI is just like with international trade, uh, the grass always seems greener on the other side of the lawn. Um, people tend to see negative and not see the positive of FDI when it goes both ways. Uh, somebody from another country buys or builds a factory in your country and you see that as a threat because now foreigners will own you, will make you work for them, and you will have not many choices. This is especially true as a concern in poorer countries like Eastern European countries, where people feel that they're being now um, 
uh, if not enslaved, then um, occupied in a sense or uh, sold out to foreigners. At the same time, your own companies uh, establish subsidiaries uh, overseas, either buy or uh, create companies there. You see that as a betrayal. You see that as, well, you should have spent the money here. You should have, should have created companies here rather than overseas because, you know, we need to create jobs here, not in China or not in America. So everybody seems to be unhappy. It almost uh, like, you know, with international trade in general, no matter what happens, if it crosses the border, there are always people who are not happy about that, either for patriotic reasons or for whatever other reasons they have. So here is a question for you. Let's see if you know the answer. And the answer here is C. While all of these four theories we've discussed in previous lectures and this lecture, we talked about how, how FDI is often determined or uh, directed by the international product life cycle, when we talked about the computers, marketing perfections, you know, different uh, tax rates, different uh, salary uh, rates, different uh, import tariffs, and we talked about trade barriers, right? Like import tariffs in this particular case, Mexico, the United States. Comparative advantage theory, no, that's not something that is uh, discussed or was discussed in the context of FDI. Now, this is what you need to know on the exam if you're taking this course for credit. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll see you in the next lecture.